Well, next up we have Mike Shooter, um, and he's going to talk to us a little bit more and expand upon what he shared yesterday. It's uh, really interesting how Mike and his family, they see a problem, and they aren't afraid to, to go into the shop and uh, build the things that are necessary to make it happen. So I remember, how long ago did you do the 60-foot uh, uh, nitrogen bar? Has that been, what, six, seven, eight years now? Yeah. Yeah, and, and coming up with the unique folding arrangement for a high clearance sprayer to be able to do that, uh, that that's pretty neat. And then plus you were doing the cover crop seeding with your miller way before that, probably one of the first ones in the industry to do that. Um, and he's done a lot of things with strip till that have been very innovative, very first for those kind of things. So a very innovative family farm, and uh, just because you can't buy it doesn't mean he won't build it. So Mike, please continue on and, and share what you have for us. <coughs> well, thank you, Money. Um, get into our operation again. Uh, kind of a, a, a sad moment for our family, but um, two sons. Today they are helping a neighbor with uh, three other operations trying to harvest 160 acres of corn because the neighbor's son passed away two days ago. So. That's the kind of guys they are. Our operations, uh, basically 3,200 acres, uh, corn, soybeans, wheat. Uh, we've added wheat into the rotation to have a place to go with hog manure. Now with the organics that we're adding in, we're probably going to use the organics for where we put our hog manure from now on, but uh, that's kind of where we're at. And then we'll put a cover crop cocktail behind that wheat to help improve that soil. <coughs> Again, you saw these two guys yesterday. Um, they're just, uh, they're the reason we're doing what we're trying to do, trying to maintain the operation, trying to move it forward. These will be the, the fifth generation on this farm. Uh, my grandfather, moved there roughly in in 1950 um, previous previously he was in the southern southeastern part of the state and and the families farmed down there for many generations before that but this is the this will be the fifth generation on the farm ground we're farming right now <coughs> that 3200 acres we've got about uh, 20% of that, 630 acres I think it is now that will be in inorganic, which we've had some organic corn this past year, uh, and the rest of it will be in transition. We'll have two fields that will be organic for next year, and, or for this year now. We're already in this year, aren't we? <laughs> so on our corn acres, usually in our uh, regenerative operation, we're doing strip till ahead of the corn, no till ahead of the soybeans. Um, this is a picture of our strip till unit. Got two or three pictures of it. Um, when we put this together, um, we start strip tilling about 15 years ago, and this is on the ground that that's today been no tilled for 35 years. So um, we're getting soil health to where we need it, but we're not there yet. We're we're still striving for that. Um, another picture of that unit. Uh, notice the cart behind it. We've got three separate compartments in that cart. Originally, uh, now we're using uh, potash and phosphate separately in, in those com compartments, plus we'll use a micronutrient package that uh, we found that we really like. Um, developed by Midwest BioAg, which has, as the base is, uh, the off falls from a bioreactor from a, from a large dairy operation, and they're adding micronutrients to that. So we're using that for a micronutrient package, and beginning to think that that's probably more of what we're going to be looking at is, is we're cutting back on the use of potash and phosphate all the time, probably going to eliminate it in some areas uh, once we get the soil health working the way we want it. Uh, 
but going to more micronutrients, maybe looking at at some other biologicals that we can put down in the strips to to help with that. Um, again, this is <coughs> strip tilling into a 14-way cover crop cocktail. Um, this is the cocktail that we use uh, use behind our wheat, and also we've gotten to the point that we we put this cocktail mix in in wet areas if we have a an area that drowns out sometime uh, once that dries up we'll go in and, and put that cocktail mix in and this is again the, the list of the cocktail mixes in there and we've got sun hemp in there so we're we're trying to get ahead of the hemp game too I guess uh, we're <coughs> industrial hemp is going to be available in Indiana but uh, I doubt if recreational hemp gets to be available in Indiana very very soon. You never know how the legislature is going to handle that one. But uh, but this is the, the mix we're using. We're trying to do cool season grasses, warm season grasses, cool season broadleafs, and warm season broadleafs. And, and every year we use this mix, and, and we vary it back and forth. We'll, uh, this past year, I, I think there were 18 species in the mix this past year. So. Uh, but we're also looking at them, and, and some of the species will be more predominant than others in different years. The first year we, we used this, I remember the sunflowers were just very predominant. The next year, sorghum sedan grass was predominant, and it probably got six, seven foot tall. So it, it just, uh, a lot of it depends on when we get it in, timing we get it in, the rains after that. And, and just how things start coming up and, and developing from there. And then it's, uh, you, you see our organic uh, cocktail mix that we tried this fall. Uh, part of that will be winter killed, uh, but the Austrian winter peas and the Blancia clover, uh, we're hoping to come through the, the winter. Again, this fall was not very conducive for cover crops, I don't know what what your areas were like, but uh, cover crops were not very conducive as far as getting off to a good start and, and growing well. So um, we're going to have to see where we're at this spring. We may have to go to plan E or F to, to get our control, weed control for our organic uh, operation this time. A little few more pictures of, of what we what we like to see. Uh, this is a field of bean stubble that's had uh, annual ryegrass and annual ryegrass and rape, I believe, in in this field. Uh, we're actually applying our cover crops and normally in in the standing crops before we start harvest with the miller cedar. We'll see later. Uh, trying to get those established before we even get into harvest, and a lot of times the uh, Bean crop, we like to be in there and seeding. Uh, when most of the leaves start turning yellow, uh, get it seeded, and then you get leaf drop on top of that cover crop seed and, and helps hold the moisture in there and, and get a good start with it. And then we'll come in and, and strip till those fields uh, after that. <coughs> uh, ground that we're going to soybeans with will be seeding cereal rye into the corn into the corn field before we uh, start harvest on those. Uh, we like to start seeding the cereal rye probably the middle of August and and like to be done with all of our cover crop seeding by the middle of September. That just didn't happen this year. Um, most all of our bean crop had a lean to it for some reason with, with the high winds we've had and and so we didn't want to go back into it again because uh, we've already been in there once or twice with post applications and, and we try to go back through the same passes each time we're in there so we don't do any more damage than we have to. And, and this year with it leaning, we just didn't want to go back into that bean crop and, and had a hard time getting stuff seeded after harvest this year because of the cold, wet, wet fall that we've had. Come spring then, there's a couple pictures here of, of what it looks like when we're planting. Um, 
this picture here we have spray terminated this field but it's not dead yet um, and it kind of depends on on the timing of the spring and, and what what cards you get dealt that spring as to how we handle things because some springs will be able to terminate earlier and end up going into a field of residue that looks like this and and again this is a field that we're planning green into even though it's been terminated um, cereal rye for the soybean crop we're we're trying to do as much planting green in into cereal rye as we can two years ago we had a good opportunity to because of the rains pushed us a little later in our planting season we were able to roll terminate uh, with a roller crimper that cereal rye that year and basically eliminated a, a burn down pass for for that year so that's an economical advantage to being able to do that and the, the cover crops have done a good job of holding the weeds at bay uh, in the meantime so we were just able to save some money by being able to roll terminate them that year. Um, a lot of times this is what we look like if if we've got time to spray terminate ahead of time and that really depends on on the weather because one of the things we we like to do is when we're going to use a spray termination we want to see warm temperatures we want to see the cover crops actively growing and we want to see a week of warm temperatures coming up if if we get a spray onto a product onto a, a plant and then it cools off and and that plants not actively growing it's not going to take up the, the chemistry it needs to 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 kill it so um, several other pieces to the what some of us call the Bible of how to how to use spray termination of, of We'll use uh, citric acid in there to to eliminate uh, or to change the pH so we'll get a, a better kill on, on the way we're going. Another picture of how we we're staying right on the strip till rows in the spring. Um, I, I guess if I take this picture again, I'll probably need to clean the windshield off so that it doesn't look like we've got birds flying all over the field while we're, while we're planting. I didn't catch that when I'd done the picture to begin with. But um, but this is the way we've got our planter set up. We've got row cleaners on the front of it. Uh, we've got two different, on the planter right now, we've got two different fertilizer applications. We're putting a Pen 34O product down right in the row, two to three gallons per acre. Um, and then we're pulling a tank that's that's got 28% in it that we're putting 28% out the back of the planter um, with totally tubular tubes behind the closing wheels, and, and uh, that 28%'s got some uh, uh, a boron product with it that's. Uh, that's helping to keep that product green um, and and just we've got a lot better green corn once we get that uh, that fertilizer package put together and, and uh, we just had problems seemed like with the no-till of the crop not coming up well not taking off well is part of the reason we went to strip tilling to get some nutrients down underneath it and uh, bring it up at that time and, and, and get it going. So uh, now we've, we've got a fertilizer package that uh, really works to, to keep that crop going. It, our, our corn will always come up green and stay green where when it cools off and, and neighbor's corn's all turning yellow, ours is, is still staying green because it's got the nutrients there to take care of it and part of that's the, the soil health that we've got um, this year we had uh, something real interesting that, that we've seen um, we had one field of corn 
that had some down areas in it. We had neighbors that had total fields of corn that were down, uh, just not good root systems. Um, we got to looking at what was going on, and and I think, I mean, we're pretty much convinced that the soil health we've got gave us a whole lot better root system. The biology was there to, to keep the roots growing. Uh, the, the corn crop did not have to cannibalize that stalk to, because it had the nutrients there to, to take care of it. A lot of guys were talking about the, their stalks were, were falling over at the roots. Uh, they just did not have a good root system. And most all of those are, are tillage of some sort so they don't have the soil health there that I think we've got to, to keep that crop growing and, and uh, maintain a good, good crop, good corn stalk there to keep that crop up. Um, so we're, we're pretty much convinced that we're on the right track. We just uh, need to keep pushing down that track to get to, get to where we want to be. Um, <coughs> Nutrient-wise, um, well, let's go to the next picture here. You saw these pictures yesterday of, of a neighbor that's got uh, uh, this bean field was planted the corn after he field cultivated it three times. And if he'd get a rain on that field before he got it planted, it, it was pretty certain that he was going to put a field cultivator to it again, even though it was looked like a road to begin with. So. He made a pretty good road bed out of it. Um, this is directly across the road after the same inch and eight tenths of rain over over about a one hour period. And, and it just shows the difference in water infiltration we have, the, the difference in, uh, in how we can hold that water. Yet, like Scott said a little bit ago, we can get on these no-till fields a whole lot quicker than, than guys that are working ground can get on their fields. And, and it's uh, just because of the soil structure and, and the, the way the soil is structured, it will hold water better than, and, and not compact like, uh, like ground that doesn't have any soil structure to it. So, um, just it's just a thing that, to me that uh, neighbors are finally starting to see. Uh, we started no-tilling 35 years ago, like I said, and, and uh, I've pretty much not been accused of thinking in the box for a long time and started at about that point in time because all the neighbors knew we were going to be done when we went to no-till to begin with. And, and uh, we... Uh, did like we talked about, like some of them talked about yesterday. We sold the field cultivators, sold a big four-wheel drive tractor, uh, pretty much eliminated the, the opportunity to do tillage, and, and that made us learn how to take care of no-till and do it right, and, and that's kind of what's, uh, what's gone on in our operation since then. Um, like I said, we started to strip till because of, of wanting to get the corn plants off to a better start. And, than what we felt like we were doing. I just have an, an issue myself with, with and, and we're backing down on fertilizers all the time anyway, but back at that point in time, I have an issue of, of putting dry fertilizers on top of the ground and expecting them to get into the ground when we're doing no-till. When we're strip-tilling, we're putting them in the ground, we're locking them in the ground, water running across that that soil surface is not going to carry those nutrients away from us, and we're going to have them locked in where, where they'll be good use to us. So um, that's kind of the reason we've we've stayed with strip till. We're um, working that direction in our organic also to to put some different organic products down with it. Uh, but we just feel like we're better off getting that that fertility locked into the soil. And uh, then we're not going to be losing it down to, to the Gulf of Mexico and so forth to, 
cause problems down there. I know <coughs> there's there's problems with the Great Lakes uh, region and and phosphorus bloom up there, and I really think a strip till operation would do do a lot of good in in helping that be a real solution for that process up there. Go go to the f the food web here that we've talked about a little bit. Uh, no, Dr. Long's probably talking about this a lot downstairs, and and uh, but this is really the thing that's going on in once we get soil health working the way it should be. Um, we're seeing um, different organisms. Somebody talked, I think it was Scott, a little bit ago talked about nematodes and the nematodes disappearing. I don't think the nematodes disappeared. I think the right nematodes were there because there's a lot more beneficial nematodes in the soil than what there are problem nematodes. And I think if, if we test some of that soil, we'd still find the nematodes there, but they'd be more beneficial nematodes than, than predatory nematodes. So um, same thing with, with a lot of the, the fungi and, and so forth uh, that Dr. Long was talking about yesterday, the, the microfungi and, and the bacteria and so forth, that uh, how they're carrying, carrying minerals and, and nutrients back to the root system, uh, how all this is, is working together. Uh, I mean, he explained it really well and, and uh, about how the roots and the or the, the bacteria and so forth out and and they come back with the nutrients that they need. <coughs> Soil tests that we've that we've been told are, are the answer to taking care of our nutrient problems don't really capture what nutrients are in the soil. It captures what nutrients are in the soil due to an acid refraction that, that's pulling those nutrients out of the soil. Well, there's no acid in the soil that's going to release those nutrients in that level, so it's actually, it's hard to justify, once we get into a good soil health system, it's hard to justify the, the use of soil tests. We're, we're working more towards maybe a, a sap test on the plants and and things that way to look at at what we're doing. But when they uh, when this bacteria and, and fungi and so forth are sent out into the soil and and break down the nutrients that they need and, and bring them back, those nutrients aren't the ones that are going to show up in in a soil test. So uh, we just need to understand that uh, maybe the Maybe all the education that we had back 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, about how to do soil tests and how to read soil tests and how to do variable rate work with the soil test is really not not what's applicable now. Once we get into to good soil health, and and I think the Haney test is is one that's probably doing some good for us. We've had some work done on some soil tests at Cornell that, that I think is a little better test, um, and it, but it goes into a lot of soil structure issues and, and different uh, avenues that way that it's looking at. So um, just some new new sampling techniques out there that, that I think uh, we need to start looking at. I don't have my sheet like Scott did, but I've got some notes on my phone. Uh, let's start looking at, at photosynthesis a little bit. Uh, photosynthesis is what, what runs this plant. And part of what's going on is photosynthesis comes and, and manufactures the, the sugars that are fed down to the roots that, that feed the mycorrhizae and the fungi and so forth to, to 
get those to go out and, and bring the products back in. Some things that, that photosynthesis actually needs nitrogen, manganese, magnesium, and iron. And, and those products are what it takes to, to build that sugar from the photosynthesis, build the energy product that that, that photosynthesis is using to feed the plant. So we're probably looking now at, at doing some maybe uh, foliar applications of some of those products, uh, spot, I mean, specific products and not just a, a blanket foliar application of a product. We're going to be looking at, at getting a hold of the right chelated products to, to use to, to make photosynthesis work for us better. And again, they're, they're building the sugars that's feeding the organisms, uh, the billions of organisms, the livestock under the ground is the way I refer to it. And, and they're what's feeding that livestock under the ground to, to go get the nutrients that the corn plant needs. When we don't have good soil health and, and the, t the tillage factor that's really destroying soil health for many years <coughs> those operations have to apply the fertilizer because there's not the fungi and the bacteria and so forth to, to go out and get it for the plant so it has to it has to be flood flood irrigation under the ground with micronutrients and and the nutrients to get those into the plant to, to really feed that plant when if we can do good soil health and and get that bacteria and, uh, and the organisms and so forth to, to feed that plant out of the soil itself, then we don't have to spend the, the money on on products that we have to put in the ground to, to do that with. I don't know how many of you have priced 28% yet this year. A year ago, we paid $240 a ton for it price to us just last week at $300 a ton. That's about 15 to $20 an acre more in nitrogen cost for us this year. Uh, seed corn's probably going to go up. I haven't looked at the markets yet today too much, but I don't think they're going to go up a whole lot to help us out on, on the economics of where we're at. So. Um, when we can maintain good soil health and start reducing our input cost and and still maintaining good yields out of it, then that's kind of where we're headed on our regenerative side of our operation. <coughs> Get into the organic side of our operation. Um, we're using cover crop seeder that we built. Uh, we built this about about uh, 2010, uh, started seeding cover crops back then in the standing corn. That's tassel high corn. We'll be harvesting that in about three weeks after that picture was taken, probably, uh, to get those cover crops established and, and get them off and going so we've got good good green, uh, green cover there once we get the crop harvested. Uh, another product that that we build is a, a 90 foot self-contained cover crop seeder. This unit here, uh, basically you drop the spray boom off, you go hook up to, to this unit, plug things in, you can be seeding cover crops within 15, 20 minutes of, of when you were spraying. Uh, we don't have to take the tank off, we don't have to uh, do anything, everything self-contained. So this is a good unit, but 90 foot's about as big as, as we want to build that with the, with the boxes we're using. Um, uh, back to the, the 120 foot seeder, we're taking a, taking a tank off, we're putting a sulfur air tank on it. Uh, that's a self-contained unit that's uh, pressurized where it doesn't have to go through a Ventura like it does with the 
candy boxes that we're using on the smaller seeder that we have to have that to be able to blow that seed out to, to 120 foot. So that takes half a day of conversion from the time we're spraying to the time we're seeding. Everything's pretty much on the same boom. Uh, it's just uh, getting everything plumbed up uh, once we switch stuff back and forth. <coughs> Another piece that we built that Monty, Monty talked about, Miller makes uh, Miller Sprayer Company makes a, a 40 foot and a, six and a 30 foot nitrogen bar. <coughs> and we decided if we're going to be post applying nitrogen, um, a lot of what we're trying to do now is, is putting 28 on with the planter. Uh, we did eliminate anhydrous ammonia, went to all 28 last year, and side dressing with 28 pretty soon after the crop gets up and going. And some fields, depending on the variety of corn, some corn varieties will take nitrogen later than others. We can come in with this unit and put nitrogen on. Uh, I, I've even been in tassel high corn with this unit to put nitrogen on for some, some neighbors. That, uh, but it, it takes the right hybrids to be able to to use that nitrogen at that later date. And, and that's one thing we, we need to learn more, more of what we're doing with, with what hybrids. Um, it goes back to the, the first speaker we had, the keynote speaker talking about plans. We're actually probably <coughs> at least a year out on our plans to, of, of what's going into that field and, and what cover crops we want in it, what and the farther back you get, what chemical applications we're going to make to make sure we don't affect the cover crops we're going to seed that fall. I mean, that's the kind of planning process we're into now with with trying to keep the soil health uh, process going. And again, this, this nitrogen bar is pretty unique in the fact that uh, it's basically 60 foot wide, but we've got it to where designed work and fold down to 15 foot to go down the road. So uh, it's kind of a unique design that, uh, that we've developed to be able to do that with. <coughs> Keep trying to talk Monty into breaking loose of some money because he really likes the, what that thing's able to do for us, but uh, he hadn't done that yet. Maybe after he makes all the money on this conference, he can, he can do that. We'll just have to see. <coughs> On to organics a little bit more. Uh, this is a, a roller crimper. We don't build this. Uh, this is a piece that we bought uh, bought through D Dave Brandt over in Ohio. Uh, that's an, another area that if you're going to be getting into soil health, get a network. Get guys that you can talk to. They don't necessarily have to be neighbors because a lot of your neighbors uh, are going to want to pick your brain and, and then use it against you later on. But I, I mean, I've got a network all over the state of Indiana, all over different regions. Gabe's a, a good friend. Dave Brandt's a good friend. Uh, Jamie Scott, some of you probably heard, is uh, one I work with primarily on the cover crops. and. He helps me out with uh, with some of the concoctions we're using. So, uh, but get a network that you can talk to guys with. Uh, roller crimper. What we're doing with that uh, primarily uh, primarily got it to roll crimp cereal rye ahead of soybeans in uh, in an organic system. Now what we're doing with it is is we'll plant the beans and then turn around and roll crimp it right after that. We found that if we roll crimp it first and we don't have a good uniform mat there, then, then we're affecting our depth control on the planter. Um, maybe we need to be, I mean, I've seen some discussion going around. Maybe we need different planters to get through that residue to 
to really make it work, but uh, we've, we've just found um, that roll crimping it after we plant it works better. Uh, Aaron Silva, who's a professor at University of Wisconsin in Madison, who's a, another mentor that I use a lot, uh, she's gone in and, and planted beans in 30 inch rows in the standing cereal rye and waited two weeks before she roll crimped the cereal rye. Cereal rye needs to be roll crimped at anthesis or when it's pollinating to really do the, the primary job of killing it. Before that, it, it won't necessarily kill it. And if you crimp cereal rye too early in it and it doesn't terminate it, then it gets real ugly because it's really pissed off by that time. And it'll come back and, and haunt you later on in the season. Uh, you can get by a little bit later, but but there's about a five or eight day window that that you can really need to be roll crimping cereal rye. So uh, at, at the right time, uh, this thing needs to be running quite a bit. This is actually the first tractor operation that our now 11 year old green card operator a year ago he was doing some of the roll crimping by himself in that tractor and that's in an operation like ours it's hard for a kid like that to get seat time in something because most everything we're doing has has a unit attached to it that's doing something important to the operation but he was able to, to get seat time in this and and that's the reason he's now getting seat time in a green cart by himself and, and doing a good job with it. And, and that's just, we raised our sons too quick. I, I will admit to that. I would do that again. Uh, our boys had, had checkbooks when they were in junior high that they had to take care of themselves. They had a, a fair to finish hog operation when they were in junior high. Dad didn't go out to take care of things. They figured out when they, when they wanted to farrow, and they put the boars in. They had 18 sows at one time. <coughs> Not a big operation, but, but they took care of that before school and after school. And, and the older one played about all the sports he could. The younger one played football, but <coughs> that they knew that that was part of their job was to take care of their hogs on a daily basis and, and uh, I would do that again because I told you a little bit ago what they're doing today and and I just uh, really appreciate my two sons and and how they can manage the operation when when I'm not there I my goal was to get them to be able to manage the operation as quick as I could in case I wasn't there. Uh, 2014, like I said yesterday, I went through quadruple bypass surgery. I didn't have a worry about the farm. I had a worry about me. My wife had a worry about me, probably more than I had. <coughs> but I didn't have a worry about the farm because the way those guys were, were raised on a farm, they're into soil health. They're, they, after we had our field day this year, and they saw more of what I've been hearing and, and learning and, and discussing for the last several years of what soil health is and, and where we need to go with it. They're really on board um, with adding, I mean, we made the decision within two or three days of that field day to add, add about 370 more acres to our organic operation just because they understand and see the value in, in what we're doing. I mean, they saw the value in what we're doing this fall with, with the corn stands the way it did and, and not going down like, like all the neighbors did. So they're, they're on board with this. Um, this is then the hot water weeder project that we're working on. Um, primarily built this for the organic no-till. We, we want to 
we are going to make organic no-till work. Now, there's a lot of challenges to it. And like I said yesterday, if somebody can figure out a harder way of farming than organic no-till, let me know because it's got a lot of challenges out there. But um, weed issues are probably the biggest problem followed by nitrogen sources and the nitrogen sources are our cover crops. And so that backs it down to the weed issues are probably our number one issue. We've looked at, at several different things. Uh, we were headed to put this together for last spring. I uh, had a good friend that had a, had a flamer weeder that, that wanted us to use it and, and see how it worked. At that point in time, we were also talking with Don Equipment, which we worked back and forth with Don quite a little bit. Uh, they were working on a Romo unit, which I thought we were gonna have some units of it to, to build a unit that we could do some, some mowing of weeds in, in between the corn rows at that point in time. And that process got slowed down. And because we were expecting some other things, this process got slowed down, so um, we didn't get this process finished till basically the first of September. We had it and introduced it at our field day and, and had it in this, this field behind the shop here, um, testing it out a little bit. Uh, we've still got a lot of work to do on, on getting it fine-tuned, what nozzles we want to use, what water volume we want to use, but where this thing was was tested there in that field, and that's just just grass that's been mowed off. So it's it's. Right. I don't know what size. I mean, that's the thing. One of the other things we've got to learn is how big a. I mean, basically, the smaller the better. Um, probably six inches tall. I mean, we can get, the way that's built, we can get probably eight, 10 inch tall weeds underneath it. But can we get, can we get them covered the way we want with the hot water to blister enough to cause them to dehydrate to, to die? That's really a question we've got to, We've got to answer yet with it. How much water? The smaller weeds probably going to take less water than the bigger weeds are going to take, and and just the the amount of water we're going to have to use, and and the capacity of the heaters we've got. We're actually in the process of building this unit out to to a 12 row. If you look at the look at the bar right right here's the two wings that that'll fold out to, to make that a 12 row unit. Um, and so we're in the process of getting that built out to 12 row unit. It may take three or four times to get to the point that, <coughs> that the corn canopy can take care of the weed control or the bean canopy. <coughs> right now we've been, been putting beans in 15 inch rows. <coughs> or drilling them in seven and a half inch rows. Now, in the, mostly in the organics, we were drilling them in seven and a half just to get canopy closure quicker. With this unit, we may, I mean, that, that's a piece to the puzzle we don't know yet because it depends on, on what kind of canopy we've got with the cover crops as to whether we put this in in 30 inch rows to where we can bring this unit in and and kill some of that if we need to it, it's kind of going to depend on the spring and and the cards we get dealt in the spring as to whether we i mean i can't tell you today whether we're going to put beans in in organic beans in the 30 inch rows or in seven and a half inch rows till i know what we get coming out of the winter <coughs> Our intent is to spray the hot water. Yeah. Now we're keeping it, <coughs> keeping it under pressure, and we're hoping to get that water to 
230, 220, 230, 240 degrees, which is, I mean, water steams at, at 212. But if you hold it under pressure, you can get it hotter. And uh, I mean, this is the, the heater unit we've got on it right now. We're, we've got two bigger heater units that we're going to put on it when we build it out to, to the 12 row unit. But I'm hoping we're, we can run four or five mile an hour. But I don't know that till we, till we know how much water it takes to do the job and comparing that to what we can generate. We're going to be able to, I think with the two bigger heaters, we're going to be able to generate about 24, 25 gallon of 160 to 170 degree temperature rise in the water is, is where I, what I think we'll have to work with. Now, we've still got to, we still got to work out the nozzle we, we're going to use. It'll be a stainless steel nozzle of some sort. Everything on this is is either stainless steel or we're using hydraulic hose to take care of the water once it's heated. Um, I mean, it's it's basically hooking up to the to the water tank and the pump to force the water through it. But once it's heated, we're we're going to be using hydraulic hose to maintain, try to help maintain the heat in there and keeping it sized right to the point that it's moving through there in a hurry and not not having time to s cool down. I mean, right now we're looking at trying to, I mean, things are trying to build for about 15 gallon of water to the acre. Well, that's enough. I We don't know until we get it in the field. And again, it, it's going to vary depending on, on weed size, I think, too. I mean, like I say, we can get, um, I mean, there's about, f I think, four inches between there that 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 opening is going to be plus it's it's um, there's a round pipe across there so that it'll roll being a roll weeds underneath it instead of injuring them we're trying not to injure that weed when we when we get it into that hood and then that way it'll take that water and and I mean it goes back to you injure a weed that you're putting chemistry on. It's not going to take that up. So we're trying not to injure that weed anymore than we, we have to. We want it dead, but we don't necessarily want it injured, which goes back to that, that cow on Gabe's place is going to have one bad day. <laughs> we hope that weed has one bad day, but we don't want to injure it before that. I mean, another thing that we could use in there is vinegar is approved for organic. Vinegar's, vinegar will kill basically anything, it, but the, the rates are looking at 15 gallon of vinegar to the acre, which 20 to 30% vinegar is what we need to be using to do that. And we, I was about that close to, to ordering a half a transport or a transport load of vinegar to, to do some burn down with this spring, and, and the guy was just, not really wanting to deal and and wanting to get the transportation figured out and and I was going to have a crop up before I could get the vinegar sprayed so we backed off of that but that's another option of maybe maybe half vinegar half water I I need to understand the boiling point of vinegar too to see whether that affects what we're doing but um, but that's another product we could use so some some adjuvants that that might help us along that line too. Like I said, we started down the, the path of of using the flamer. I mean, it can make a really nice flame about three foot tall over several acres if you get all that residue on fire, which in organic no till the residue is part of what we're we're working towards. So I just done some research. Um, there's some of this been done years ago overseas that that I saw some some ideas on. Um, I don't know that anybody's messed with it in this country. Uh, I've heard since we've developed this that maybe there's something out of Australia that's that's looking at the same thing. I don't know, but um, it just. 
it's those four o'clock in the morning brain waves that come through is part of what what got me there I think anytime you you cut that weed it's gonna it's not going to take the next step you're going to do to it. Right. Um, it was interesting that Scott mentioned the, the tine weeders. Um, that's one thing we've, we've kind of toyed with. Um, I saw them down at the Acres Conference in, in Louisville a month or so ago. Been looking at them a, a little bit. Maybe that's something we end up adding between the row units uh, to do a little work in the row. I don't know. We're, we're going to look at that a little bit to see if, if that's another option to help us with what's in the row. Um, also, would like to, to look at a, a bio crop of some sort that, I mean, I'm always looking for a companion crop to put in the cornfield. I love buckwheat. I would like to have buckwheat in that cornfield all year long. But maybe there's something we can add into to just that row, row there, the six inches that we've got that was strip tilled, which you're only tilling about an inch, inch or two wide, but maybe there's something we can put in a six inch strip there, cover crop wise, companion crop wise, that, that can help us with the weed control. In that, in that row. I mean, that's, to me, going to be our biggest issue is, is the in-row in row control of, of weeds we're looking at. And like Gabe said, a few weeds, a, a few weeds are not the death of everything. Um, I mean, we're looking at, at trying to do organic no-till. Um, we had the corn crop that we had this year on on 75 acres was was 70 bushels the acre. Not what we wanted, not what we expected, but with the weed control issues that we had, that's that's what we got. Well, that corn crop was sold at 1050 a bushel. Now you look at some of you've got your phones. You can do the math on 1050 a bushel on 70 bushels isn't too far from where we're at with 212 bushel per corn average on everything else we grew at the price we're looking at now. So I think we've got room to, and, and Gabe said it best, it's, it's not the yield, it's the revenue we're going to generate off that field. And, and when we go to organics, we don't have to generate as much revenue as much yield to get the revenue off the field that we want to do. So it lets us it lets us maintain our soil health with what we need to do to maintain our soil health and still get an in, a good income off that that acre of ground. Little, <laughs> little piece on nutrient density. Um, I really Jacob done a, a book report on the man John Deere and a, uh, a couple years ago and for school and, and talking about how he designed the plow and built the plow and so forth. I'm not sure that nutrient density didn't start leaving our, our produce about the time John Deere invented the plow. It started destroying the soil health that we had at that time. And maybe Monty's size, my size, have to do with John Deere inventing the, the plow and changing nutrient density so that we had to take in a lot more starch to get the nutrients we needed. So I, uh, I kind of blame John Deere for, <laughs> for needing to lo still lose a little more weight. Right now, if it comes through, we'll have have um, Austrian winter peas and Balancia clover, Balancia fixation clover, in that field. Um, that's the that's where you're headed with that. Is is that's 
what we're using for nitrogen source. And so if we can if we can kill that, keep that mat there, then that's going to help on the weed control. It, it's it's all combination of of using cover crops to maintain weed control, using cover crops to get our nitrogen source. I'm not concerned about potash and phosphate. There's enough potash and phosphate in these soils that we don't need to be concerned about applying that, but that crop needs nitrogen every year. And like I said earlier, in photosynthesis, nitrogen's probably the, the biggest factor, and that's, that's where yield comes from, is photosynthesis. So, um, it, it all ties together, I think. And if we can kill that, or maybe we don't kill it, maybe we stun it for a while. I mean, I've, like I said, I'm always looking for a companion crop. Uh, one of them I like is buckwheat in corn, but I'm always looking for a companion crop that can help with the nitrogen source that we need for that crop. And is there a, is there a strawberry clover? Sounds intriguing. I don't know anything about it, but I need to learn something about it. But <coughs> white clovers are probably something that we're going to be looking at. I've even thought about taking, I mean, we've got a, a field that we've got that's pure, pretty much pure alfalfa going in and, and planting corn into an alfalfa field. Maybe going in and harvesting the, the first cutting of that alfalfa, turn around and get corn in it that next day and, and just let that alfalfa go. It'll, <coughs> as, as long as we don't, as long as we don't lose the water supply we need for that corn crop <coughs> by the alfalfa, think it could help us in the long run. You let that alfalfa go, it's going to it's going to senesce after after it matures. Normally we're cutting it so it'll grow again, but if we don't cut it, could it be a companion crop that's going to be a nitrogen source for us? That's something I encourage the discussion to keep going. It's uh, about time for me to get off of here, so well, I want to take a moment just to thank my couple of things just as we're listening there. Um, just uh, that folks that we've got here like Mike are proactive, not reactive, constantly thinking you guys are having all these questions. He's trying to think of things to do, and, and then he's implementing them and testing them. The other thing that he said was crop planning. Uh, this stuff doesn't happen without him thinking several iterations ahead as to what he wants to do and we find that key in what we're trying to do and the last thing that I think is uh, the reason why a lot of us are here is that legacy and him talking about leaving that legacy for his family that he wasn't worried about his farm and um, that's a lot of what we're trying to focus on too is being able to leave a legacy for our family our kids um, um, I'm on a century farm myself, so I have a, I have a great appreciation for that. Um, and so, um, also he said, uh, we are going to make organic work. He didn't say we're trying to figure it out. He said we're going to make it work. So uh, that was neat.